First of all, uh, those of you who've never heard uh, Craig speak before now know why Oxford University Press asked him, despite being a non-specialist, why he should write this book about Luther. And he was also smart enough to have uh, uh, an introduction and a presentation in which he actually put his just released book up on up on the screen for everybody, so you all know what it what it looks like, and and you can all uh, you can all buy it now. My my two takeaways, among many, from his talk are uh, first of all um, a reaffirmation of not only what a what a terrific um, historian and storyteller he is, um, but also uh, the way in which he's able to uh, evoke uh, a sense of empathy and understanding and uh, about the contingency and the otherness of of the past. It was really marvelously well done. The other thing I took away from his presentation was. Um, an ethnographic one that perhaps the um, understanding of the early 16th century in the Utah population, or at least the Salt Lake area, uh, could stand in need of some improvement. Um, a real pleasure to be here um, as part of the conference. Thanks to the, the organizers and our hosts at the Maxwell Institute and at BYU. It's great to be back at BYU where I've given uh, uh, talks before and, and a, a real gratitude for the, for the terrific turnout. Um, you will doubtless have discerned from the ellipsis at the end of Craig's title and the beginning of mine, our two talks are meant to fit together and it's going to be um, historical analysis in two very different modes. Like his talk, uh, mine is meant to convey something of a just published book, which in my case uh, appeared this past week from Harper One, entitled Rebel in the Ranks, Martin Luther, the Reformation, and the Conflicts that Continue to Shape Our World. Subtitle slightly different. When you work with a trade press, you lose control over what they want to call it, as Craig knows um, much more frustratingly than I do, but I'll leave that for another uh, <laughs> discussion. Luther definitely plays a part in, in my book as well. Essentially, Craig devotes in a responsible way an entire book to what I compress irresponsibly into a single chapter, namely Luther from about 1516 to 1522. But from there, my book expands outward, geographically as well as chronologically, offering an analytical narrative about the relationship between the Reformation era and the present day Western world. It seemed appropriate here at this conference to offer something of that in our first session, complementing, I hope, Craig's focused and evocative concentration on Luther, his sensibilities, his actions, and his intentions. What Luther intended and set in motion is one thing, and what happened despite his intentions is another. I'm going to make a broad argument uh, this morning with two main components. First, the Protestant Reformation was not only important in the 16th century, but its influence persists and remains essential for understanding our world today, and that is regardless of whether you happen to be a Protestant of some kind, or a religious believer from another tradition, or a secular unbeliever. And second, in the early 21st century, the Reformation's influence is by and large indirect and the opposite of what any of the major reformers of the 16th century, including Martin Luther and John Calvin, wanted the reform of Western Christendom to achieve. For the long-term, unintended, unanticipated, and yet undeniable overriding outcome of the Reformation has been the secularization of Western society. Western modernity in its dominant institutions, ideas, values, and practices, including in the United States, is not an outgrowth or an expansion of the Protestant Reformation in any of its 16th century expressions. It's rather a reaction against the Reformation era and the way in which its doctrinal disagreements and its concrete conflicts made Christianity into an unprecedented problem to which modernity has been the response in ways that have facilitated secularization. If you want to understand the world that we're living in today, you've got to understand the Reformation and the unanticipated changes it set in motion, like all those people that were interviewed in the video understand so well. <laughs> See, I can be funny occasionally. I generally am not in my talks. My talks are gravely intense and serious, just an FYI. So any chance I get to try a joke, you know, and the ones that fall flat, you make a joke about that and then people laugh at you. It all works out, so that's all good. I never would have made it as a stand-up comic. My argument this morning is entirely about the historical consequences of the Reformation era 
and not at all about which, if any, among the many Christian traditions that emerge from it is correct or mistaken, admirable or worthy of contempt, right or wrong, good or bad, in what proportions, the criteria for assessing these issues, and so forth. As we will see, those sorts of judgments are left up to individual preferences, about which there are indefinitely many positions and myriad disagreements precisely as a consequence of modern attempts to address problems inherited from the Reformation era. So then, I've um, structured this talk this morning as um, a kind of contrived play in four acts, preceded by a prelude, which parallel the four chapters of my book. So here's a preview of where we're headed. Act one, the story of the Reformation rightly begins, as we've just heard, with Martin Luther. There is no way to understand it without him. And during the years from 1516 through 1522, as we've just heard uh, from Craig, an unlikely, unanticipated, contingent series of events catapults him from being an essentially unknown university professor to the most famous author in Europe, a man who defied both pope and emperor. I am mostly going to skip over this act after my, my prelude because, of course, Craig has covered it so well. Act two. As soon as Luther publishes his ideas and becomes a public figure, the Reformation becomes a movement he couldn't and did not control. Those Christians who rejected the papacy disagreed about the content and the implications of true Christianity. Act two moves from a man to a movement, that of the early Reformation in Germany and Switzerland during the 1520s. Act three. If the Reformation had remained within Swiss and German borders, it wouldn't have had nearly the impact that it did. Rulers opted for or against its various forms as it spread to other countries, resulting in new Christian traditions as well as contentious Christian pluralism. Act three then moves beyond the early Reformation as a German movement to the Reformation era throughout Europe, covering the period from 1520 to around 1650. And finally, Act Four. In order to understand why the Reformation still matters, we need a wider perspective still to see how the formation of the modern Western world since the 17th century has been largely a series of responses to problems inherited from the Reformation era. Religion was redefined to accommodate disagreements and to insulate public life from it. Multiple complex processes of secularization that followed continue to work their way out today. So my talk, like my book, starts small and expands outward in its subject matter, its time frames, and its geographical range. It moves through a prelude and four acts from late medieval Christianity to one Augustinian friar to a German movement, a, Reformation, a European era, and Western modernity as a whole. Prelude, Christianity as more than religion. Today, religion is your individual choice, including the option not to be religious at all. It's considered a distinct area of life among others, separate from your career, professional relationships, recreational activities, consumer behavior, and so forth. Neither of these things was true in early 16th century Europe. Save for the tiny percentage of Jews, in Latin Christendom who chose to remain Jewish despite their frequent recurrent mistreatment by Christians, religion wasn't a matter of choice, nor was it separate from the rest of life. Becoming a Christian was the result of a taken for granted centuries old ritual of infant baptism, and religion wasn't hived off from the rest of life. It didn't stand apart from the exercise of power or the administration of justice, but was meant to inform both politics and law. Christianity wasn't segregated from the buying and selling of goods in the pursuit of profit. Its ethical teachings sought to circumscribe economic transactions and restrain greed. Education was imbued with Christian ideas, from the teaching of ABCs and humble small town primary schools through instruction in one of Europe's 60 or so universities, the universities of Erfurt and Wittenberg among them. Social relationships and gender expectations were inseparable from Christian norms, and both public and private morality were conceived in Christian terms. Christianity was meant to influence not only how Christians worshiped and prayed, but also how they ruled and worked, bought and sold, taught and learned, related to their families and understood their lives. In short, religion was about much more than what we usually mean by religion today. None of this implies that 
very many people behaved like saints. Far from it. That was one problem the Reformation sought to address, although it wasn't its leader's main concern. Conscientious Christians had been aware of the problem long before Martin Luther appeared on the scene. Sinful shortcomings in the church and the lives of its members, including its clerical leaders, affected everything else because of how intertwined religion was with the rest of life. For centuries before the Protestant Reformation, the gap between Christian ideals and lived realities was a problem lamented by men and women who were saintly and sought reforms, say Bernard of Clairvaux in the 12th century or Catherine of Siena in the 14th. Without questions, there were serious problems perceived in the late medieval church, including the Western Schism, conflicts over authority between conciliarists and papalists, worldly Renaissance popes and cardinals, greedy members of the clergy, and ill-informed, superstitious lay people. So no wonder there was a reformation, the traditional explanation went, considering the corruption of the church, decadence of the papacy, and superstition of the laity. Luther came along to save the day and to rediscover the gospel. But more than a half century of scholarship by medieval historians has corrected this picture with massive evidence about the vitality and the vigor of late medieval Christianity from lay Bible reading in the vernacular, the only place where this isn't the case incidentally is England, to the voluntary lay support of parish churches and religious orders, to the enthusiastic participation of the laity in confraternities, and much more. In fact, one could argue, 15th century Christians, top to bottom, were probably more self-consciously devout than their predecessors in any preceding century. The Reformation emerged as much out of religious commitment as a reaction against the church's shortcomings. Indeed, these two things often went together. People usually bother, to, right, they, they want to reform about the things they love and care about. Yet something else is more fundamental for explaining the long-term impact of the Reformation and how our present contrasts with the most basic objectives of its leaders. The key point is that religion wasn't something separate from other areas of life. It wasn't something you could step, step away from or decide you didn't want to affect your life. You didn't have to be devout, but you couldn't avoid living in a Christian society. Religion was never just about religion. It influenced everything else for better or worse. So because religion was interconnected with everything else, changes in religion would affect everything else. And the Reformation brought changes in Latin Christianity unlike anything else in the Middle Ages in its geographical scope, its staying power, and its transformative influence. The Reformation affected not only religion, but also everything related to religion in the 16th century. In other words, just about every major aspect of human life. Seeing that religion then was about more than religion gets us one step closer to why the Reformation still matters today. Because religion influenced so much more, changes in religion and disagreements about Christianity had consequences that went far beyond religion as we usually think about it. And those enduring changes and consequential disagreements started with an Augustinian friar and a university professor anxious about his own salvation, as Craig has just presented so well. My act one, very abbreviated form, Martin Luther, reluctant rebel. As I mentioned, Craig's just provided in much more detail, as it were, the first act of my play. So like I do with all other scholars, I take their things, subsume them into my huge vision, and say thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, but rather ask you to recall and insert what he said here into my exposition. Explaining why the Reformation still matters today, regardless of our own views, doesn't depend on whether we happen to find Luther fascinating, like his theology, agree with him, cheer, go Luther, go silently when we're hearing him object to indulgences or whatever. He matters historically because of what he set in motion, the basis on which he set it in motion, and how transformative both of those have been. I want to emphasize just one point, in my view the most consequential for understanding what happened as a result of Luther's actions, but despite his intentions. As a result of his actions, but despite his intentions. Luther repeatedly stated his willingness to retract any views about which he could be shown to his satisfaction to be mistaken. And increasingly, as we heard through his encounter with Cardinal Cayetan in October 1518, and then explicitly and publicly at the Leipzig uh, disputation with Johannes Eck in July of 1519. This had to be demonstrated to him on the basis of scripture. This insistence on God's word gave him his Archimedean point 
that he needed to reject papal authority and, for reasons that will become clear shortly, was his most consequential move as a reformer. The insistence on scripture alone as the self-sufficient, perspicuous basis for Christian faith and life. There is no understanding the Reformation without the story of Luther in the years just after 1517, but it is not the history of the Reformation. Nor is the history of the Reformation even all of Luther's ideas through to his death in the mid-1540s or the entire history of Lutheranism. Any more than his idea of Christian freedom is what most people today mean by it and what's politically protected as freedom today. What Luther started very quickly became a movement that escaped his control. Act two, the early German Reformation, a fractious movement. It would be more accurate to say that Luther never had control of the Reformation than to imply that he somehow had it and then lost it. His insistence on scripture alone as the sole final authority for Christian faith and life indeed cleared away long-standing obstacles to reform within the established church by creating a principle and a position outside it. Eventually, those Christians who rejected Rome would be called Protestants, a term first coined in 1529. As the 1520s would repeatedly show, it was much easier to denounce the church as corrupt and unbiblical than to agree on what God's word said and how it should be applied. And since religion shaped and was intended to influence every area of human life, the implications were enormous. What now was the right relationship between the church and secular authorities? Did the freedom of a Christian extend to social, political, and economic concerns? What did proper Christian worship, sacraments, and ministry look like? And who had the authority to say so? How could you tell whether someone had the right understanding of the gospel or was really inspired by the Holy Spirit? Which prophecies about the world's end were trustworthy? The questions were nearly endless. So were the answers. Those who rejected Rome disagreed about what God's word said and so about what God's truth was. So they disagreed about what Christians should believe and do. By the time Luther returned from the Wartburg castle in March of 1522, Andreas Karlstadt disputed his marginalization of the book of James his views about the Old Testament, Eucharistic practice, the oral confession of sins, and the permissibility of religious images, all based on Karlstadt's understanding of scripture. Luther and Philip Melanchthon disagreed with Huldrych Zwingli and the latter's reforming allies about the character of Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper, a dispute that inspired dozens of vitriolic pamphlets in less than four years and culminated in the dramatic face-to-face -face non-resolution at the Marburg Colloquy in 1529. This became a crucial doctrinal and therefore also ecclesial and social ground for the distinction between Lutheranism and Reformed Protestantism. Zwingli disagreed as well with his former colleagues, such as Balthazar Hudmeyer and Conrad Grebel, over the scriptural basis for infant baptism, with its enormous implications for one's model and understanding of the church, for the nature of the Christian community. This led to the origins of Swiss Anabaptism by early 1525, a year before the Zurich City Council enacted capital legislation against the Anabaptists. By early 1525, the German Peasants' War was raging, with leaders such as Thomas Munzer completely rejecting Luther's strong distinction between the gospel on the one hand and social, economic, and political concerns on the other. Other reformers, such as Hans Hergott and Michael Geismeyer, shared Munzer's insistence on the socioeconomic implications of the gospel, but they rejected his apocalyptic calls to violence. Instead, they sought communitarian Christian societies based on an undoing of traditional feudal relations. Withdrawing from dreams of remaking society as a whole, after the defeat of the common man in the Peasants' War, Anabaptists themselves proved a highly contentious lot, disagreeing among themselves in a host of doctrinally and therefore socially divisive ways, beginning already in the 1520s. And all of these disputes, of course, are in addition to the disagreements and the divisions between all of these Christians and those who remained in the Roman church. The Reformation begins with the forceful figure of Luther. It's tempting to regard the Reformation as his and rival ideas and movements as deviations from his views. But that's just a way of saying one prefers Luther's position over the others. Many of his contemporaries disagreed, as do their respective religious heirs today, Mennonites or Presbyterians, for example. 
Luther's stance was based on his principle about the authority of scripture, ratified by his personal experience. Many others embraced the principle, but rejected Luther's claims about God's word, just as he rejected the claims of those who defended the Roman church. If everyone who rejected Rome had agreed with Luther's claims about the Bible, not just the 1520s, but indeed the entire Reformation era, and in, and in fact the last 500 years of Western history would have played out very differently. That is not what happened, starting already in Wittenberg when Luther was hiding out in the Wartburg Castle. This fact and its many unintended consequences, as they unfolded in the 1520s and during the rest of the 16th century and beyond, are critical for understanding the Reformation and why it still matters today. Luther alone is a sure recipe for misunderstanding the Reformation, however personally inspiring the maxim might be for Christians who love Luther's theology. Already in the 1520s, the Reformation radically exceeded Luther's control in ways that enraged him and that reinforced his apocalyptic convictions. So the Reformation involved disagreements among Protestants no less than it presupposed their rejection of the Roman Catholic Church. This started among evangelicals in the 1520s, and it never went away. Instead of becoming a shared basis for reforming the church, the Bible became a bone of contention among Protestants as well as between Protestants and Catholics. Among other consequences, the church became the churches. This too has never gone away despite all the impressive ecumenical efforts and advances of the past half century. The Reformation was not an initially coherent movement that only later fragmented. It prompted divergent, conflicting claims about God's word and God's will right from the start. It spread like wildfire in the early 1520s through printed pamphlets and woodcut images and popular songs and word of mouth, especially in the towns and territories of the Holy Roman Empire and nearby Switzerland. In the mid-1520s, it inspired mass uprisings across much of Central Europe in the so-called German Peasants' War. Whether enemies or supporters of Rome, princes and their mercenary armies put a swift end to that. Wherever the Reformation survived and flourished after 1525, it would be contained by political authorities and controlled under their watchful eye. The decade after the Edict of Worms in 1521 critically influenced the subsequent history of Protestantism. Basic patterns were established that would endure. Few patterns were more influential than the difference between forms of the Reformation that received sustained political support and the forms that did not. Two expressions of the Reformation, Lutheranism and Reformed Protestantism, were backed by civic or princely authorities. Despite condemnation from Charles V and other Catholic leaders, the patchwork character of the Holy Roman Empire enabled them to take root. Starting in the 1520s, these magisterial Protestants, which is a term that refers to Lutherans and Reformed Protestants taken together, began to create institutions, forms of worship, statements of faith, and new ways of being Christian. These measures were implemented by political authorities working together with the new clergy, many of them former Catholic priests in these early years, from the new Protestant churches. They agreed with the medieval view that subjects in any given city or territory had to share the same religious beliefs and practices, just many different ones, of course, from Catholics. To make religion a matter of individual choice was to invite conflict and to lose the shared basis for life as a coherent social, political, and religious community. All the other expressions of the Reformation, besides these two, of which there were many more, were outlawed. Their members were punished by political authorities, whether Lutheran, Reformed Protestant, or Catholic. Lacking political patronage, these radical Protestants, as they're collectively designated, were often persecuted. Consequently, their numbers remained small until centuries later. Yet from the start, they demonstrated that God's word could be and was understood in many different ways among those who rejected the Roman church. And they're essential to understanding the Reformation as a whole and its abiding importance down to the present. They make clear that the Reformation cannot be reduced to Luther's theology or his biography or to the theology or biography of any other individual Protestant reformer. Think of Martin Luther and the unlikely events of 1517 to 1521 like a stone plunked in a pond. 
Then imagine the Reformation in the 1520s and beyond as ripples, if not waves, radiating outward in all directions, everywhere disrupting the water's surface. Those disruptions were not restricted to the Holy Roman Empire or to Switzerland, and so we move on to the next act in the play. Act three, the Reformation defines a troubled era. The spread of the Reformation throughout Europe made it the defining development of an entire historical era and not simply a German phenomenon of regional significance. This plus the fact, of course, as I've been emphasizing, that religion was intertwined with everything else throughout Christendom. Wherever it spread, magistrates and sovereign rulers had to decide how to respond, like they had in Germany and Switzerland since the early 1520s. Their responses diverged for and against. One way or another, the Reformation could not be avoided. In every territory and kingdom in Europe, political authorities had to make decisions for or against it, including regions where it was harshly suppressed and that remained most strongly Catholic, such as Spain. If all rulers had chosen for the Reformation, and in the same form, the 16th century would have been very different indeed. Instead, divergent decisions led to divisions, reflected disagreements, and contributed to conflicts that would prove crucially important to developments that still influence us today. That's why understanding the Reformation and its long-term impact means understanding the Reformation era, including not only the Protestant traditions that formed, but also the relationships between Protestants and Catholics, as well as among Protestants. As I just mentioned, political authorities that opted for the Reformation determined whose Protestantism got supported and whose got suppressed in the 1520s. The same was true throughout the 16th century and into the 17th. Lutheranism and Reformed Protestantism were the two forms that survived and flourished. You know, Anglicanism is something of a, a particular case. The term isn't used by scholars, at least in my view, responsible scholars, uh, to describe the Protestantism of the Church of England until after 1660. But that's a side note for those of you who might have a particular knowledge of or interest in Anglicanism. Because somebody, somebody in this crowd was thinking, what about Anglicanism? This guy's a Reformation scholar and he's never heard of it? No, I have. I've heard of it. Okay. <laughs> See, there it is. Another chance at a joke. Thank you very much for laughing. Starting in the 1530s, city magistrates in Geneva worked with the refugee reformer John Calvin to make their French-speaking Swiss city into a stronghold for his version of Reformed Protestantism. It would have a major impact in France, England, Scotland, and the Netherlands, as well as in parts of Germany and Eastern Europe. All other anti-Roman expressions of Christianity, besides Lutheranism and Reformed Protestantism, including those espoused by all the different Anabaptist groups, by Protestant spiritualists, other radical Protestants, were usually outlawed depending on time and place. Mostly these Christians wanted just to be left alone, at least before the 1640s in England. Catholicism was no less dependent on the choices and protection of rulers like Charles V, who decided to oppose the Reformation. They helped foster a major re-energizing of Catholicism in the 16th century, usually referred to as the Catholic Reformation or the Counter-Reformation. Reforming efforts already underway in Christendom before 1517 were extended and expanded. New ones were also taken up. A major meeting of Catholic Church leaders, the Council of Trent, convened on and off three times between 1545 and 1563. The Reformation era was thus marked as much by the renewal of Roman Catholicism as it was by the creation of magisterial and radical Protestant traditions. Magisterial Protestants and Catholics undertook some initiatives in parallel tracks. In other ways, they were locked in competitive opposition and mutual hostility. Both of these are important for understanding the Reformation era's influence down to the present. Whether Lutheran, Reformed Protestant, or Catholic, the more or less cooperative efforts of political authorities and clergy sought to channel constructive, creative religious commitments into action. Well-trained clergy preached sermons and taught catechisms, reconciled feuds and encouraged devotion, consoled the grieving and comforted the dying, praised piety and excoriated sin. They were all trying to create well-informed communities of dedicated lay Lutherans, Reformed Protestants, or Catholics, respectively. This was anything but a smooth or a uniform process. Certainly, they did not succeed across the board or as well as they wanted to. And yet, over the long term, the net result 
was that European countries forged the dominant state-supported religious identities of their subjects in the Reformation era and carried them into the modern world. Lutheran Denmark, Sweden, and much of Germany, Reformed Protestant Scotland, England, sort of, the Netherlands and parts of Switzerland, Catholic Spain, Italy, France, Austria, Ireland, Belgium, and parts of Germany and Switzerland. Far from all the laity appreciated these efforts. Some complied but resented conscientious clergy as obnoxious and intrusive. Others dragged their feet, rolled their eyes, and did as little as they could get away with. Still others dissented and became radical Protestants of one kind or another. This resentment, as a byproduct of sometimes heavy-handed methods of indoctrination and attempts to control lay behavior, would have repercussions. It would eventually inspire initiatives of liberation very different from those of Luther or other early evangelicals. At the same time, these parallel efforts to create communities of well-informed Christians coexisted with disagreements about God's truth and concrete hostilities between rival Christian regimes. The Reformation made the Christianity at the heart of Christendom into a sustained major problem, or rather a series of major problems because religion was so interconnected with the rest of life. As in the Middle Ages, it was persistently assumed that religion should shape politics and society no less than worship and piety. The period's controversies over Christian doctrine began with Luther's first criticisms of many Catholic teachings. They also ripped apart the early evangelical movement. They continued and were institutionalized as the 16th century unfolded. Doctrinal controversy became an ongoing, permanent feature of the Reformation era. The leading protagonists of these controversies were mostly, like Luther, university-trained theologians. But their views were also expressed in popular polemical propaganda pamphlets, sermons, songs that denounced papists or heretics, respectively. By the 1650s, theological experts were no closer to reconciling their disagreements than they had been in the 1520s, as they marshaled their often formidable learning to buttress their respective positions. Nor were lay Catholics and Protestants, though in many parts of Europe, in different ways and however grudgingly, they were starting to forge various means of day-to-day -day coexistence. Not wanting to give ground was understandable. Divisive disagreements about doctrine were deepened by the so-called wars of religion, which were really wars of more than religion, because religion was about so much more than religion as we ordinarily think of it. These conflicts included the Peasants' War of the mid-1520s that I've referred to, the Schmalkaldic War in the Holy Roman Empire in 1546-47, the French Wars of Religion from 1562 to 1598, the Dutch revolt against Spain that started in 1566 and wasn't resolved until 1648. The Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. Heavenly, heavenly voice from a cell phone. That's a very, very odd moment for that particular strain of angelic sounding music to come in. Okay. And finally, in this breathless sentence, the English Revolution of the 1640s and 50s. These religio-political conflicts were expensive, destructive, and inconclusive. They brought widespread di death, disease, and dislocation. They caused suffering and bitterness. They created thousands of religious refugees. It's important that we recognize the Reformation era as both constructive and destructive. Distinct, socially exclusive churches, religious traditions, and Christian identities were forged and carried forward into the modern era. And these distinct traditions were protected and promoted by political regimes whose mutual conflicts, like their disagreements over doctrine, made the Christian truth they claimed into a civilizational bone of contention. The Reformation era was a period of extraordinary religious vitality. It extended and deepened the long-standing medieval assumption that Christianity should influence and infuse all areas of human life because it came from God and it expressed God's will for human beings. Nothing was outside God's creation in which human beings literally lived and moved and had their being. So of course religion should be about more than just beliefs, worship, and devotion. It should also inform the exercise of power, shape social relationships, constrain economic transactions, and mold higher education. And in order to do this, it had to be shared in common 
It had to be collective, not merely individual. And yet it was this widely shared assumption that was precisely what made Christianity into such a major problem in the Reformation era. When people agree that religion should be the foundation of their civilization and society, but they can't agree about its content, they're in for trouble. That's why sustained disagreement, whether we like it or not, is the most decisive basic fact about the Reformation era. Painfully tragic as it is for Christians today, including those deeply committed to ecumenical dialogue and cooperation. The Reformation unintentionally made Christendom's foundation into its central problem. So it fractured violently. The open-ended disruptiveness of the Reformation as well as resistance to the Reformation were evident already in the 1520s. They never went away. In many different, often prolonged, and frequently convoluted ways, they persisted and played out across the European continent for over a century. In this process, the Reformation's leaders and opponents made Christianity itself into an unprecedented problem in Europe. By the mid-17th century, a new sort of creativity was needed if an exhausted continent was to avoid a fratricidal future. What do you do when the source of your worldview, values, and framework of meaning is also the source of recurrent large-scale violence and an insuperable impasse of ideas? Maybe you find a different source of meaning and some new ideas, or you try to. And you do what you can to restrain and redefine the original source that created the problems. That's what those espousing modern ideas and institutions, including a redefinition of religion, started doing in the mid-1600s. And so we move on. Act four, modernity as a response to the Reformation era. The Reformation was a religious revolution that led to the secularization of society. Big time paradox. It's not what Luther or any other Protestant reformers wanted but you're in a position now to understand how it happened. The Reformation made the religion of Latin Christendom into an unprecedented pervasive problem. It was rooted in doctrinal disagreements and manifest in more than religious conflicts. The problem had to be addressed. How could Christians who believed contrary things about fundamental aspects of human life on which they believed eternal salvation depended coexist in relative peace and stability? Oftentimes, it's harder to discern history's gradual processes than its discrete events. This goes also for the unintended processes of secularization that have followed from the Reformation era. We have to stand back and take a broad perspective on change over time across centuries in order to see them. They didn't emerge quickly or win the day suddenly in the 17th century or even the 19th. Religion has been and remains a constant presence in Europe and North America throughout the modern era to our own day. And until re recently, of course, it's been mostly Christianity on these two continents. Here then, secularization doesn't mean the disappearance or the elimination of religion. It doesn't mean merely a decline in the number of people who attend worship services or pray or say they believe in God. It refers rather to the diminishing influence of religion in shared public life. All those areas of human life that in the Middle Ages and in the Reformation era, what Christianity was supposed to inform. Politics, law, economics, education, social relationships, family life, morality, and the culture at large. Indeed, I would argue Western modernity is fundamentally about processes of secularization. It has everything to do with the management and the control of religion because in the Reformation era, Christianity itself became such a problem. The disagreements mattered so much because religion was about so much more than religion with eternal ramifications. So when the disagreements gained social and political traction and grew beyond a certain point, as they did in the Holy Roman Empire, in France, England, and the Low Countries, the results were cataclysmic. The basic solution to the problem then, and the core of the piecemeal processes of secularization at the heart of Western modernity, meant finding ways to make whatever was disruptive and divisive about religion matter less for public life. Christian controversies and conflicts threatened coexistence. For centuries, Christianity had been embedded in and intended to influence everything. 
So its problematic elements or features should be disembedded from everything. What would that entail? In order for it to be separated from politics, economics, social relationships at large, religion had to be conceived as something separable from them. Seen the other way around, politics, economics, and social relationships at large had to be conceived as things that could and should operate apart from religion. This meant religion itself had to be redefined as something along the lines of what we usually mean by religion. Your own interior beliefs, your preferred expressions of collective worship, and your chosen devotional practices. Those were fine because they didn't aspire to influence anything that was supposed to apply to everyone. Note, your beliefs, preferences, and choices. That is crucial. The modern redefinition of religion went hand in hand with making it an individual choice. Individual religious freedom was made possible because religion was redefined and its scope was restricted. Individuals, sometimes within the same families, as Craig knows, having written more than one book about a family like this, disagreed about religion in the Reformation era. So religious freedom would have to be protected at the individual level. This too was a dramatic change from sharing religious beliefs and practices that applied to everyone. A democratization of Luther's Hier stehe ich in a way that he would have completely rejected as his harsh polemics against those who disagreed with him make clear. Whatever its content, religion could be tolerated so long as everyone who benefited from individual religious freedom agreed on its limited scope and agreed to obey the political authorities that extended and protected the freedom. Restricting religion's scope made religious freedom and religious toleration possible, but it did more than that. Because this restriction viewed religion as separable from the rest of life, it also viewed the rest of life as separable from religion. So the restriction and the redefinition of religion opened the way to secularization through separation. Though in practice, that detachment has been and remains a very complicated process that has been unfolding over centuries and is certainly by no means entirely complete. It could also, and many times, reverses. All kinds of examples of that as well. Secularization as an ongoing process has also had a long-term intellectual dimension. It's no accident that the Enlightenment and modern philosophy started in the 17th century. In fact, two major thinkers whose ideas have been hugely influential in the modern world were themselves affected firsthand by the wars of more than religion. René Descartes was a soldier during the early years of the Thirty Years' War, and Thomas Hobbes took refuge in Paris during the English Revolution. Christian ideas about reality, human nature, and human life provided Christendom's intellectual backbone during the Middle Ages. During the Reformation era, that backbone became a bone of contention. Theological controversy that started in the 1520s remained unresolved in the 1650s after the Thirty Years' War and the English Revolution. How could entrenched religious opponents agree about human nature, morality, the nature of government, and other issues at once fundamental and divisive? They'd have to agree to disagree. They'd have to set aside their religious views when they embarked on common endeavors. Theology as a religious intellectual endeavor would have to be separated from philosophy and the investigation of the natural world, soon to become better known as science, neither of which would depend on anything divisively religious. Modern philosophy and the Enlightenment in their respective expressions emerged as intellectual reactions to the problems of the Reformation era. New ways of trying to ground morality, justify political authority, conceive society were sought. Descriptions of and prescriptions for human life would have to avoid explicit reference to religion if they hoped to persuade people who disagreed about it. If you didn't want to just keep preaching to the choir, you had to learn how to sing a different song. Ideas and institutions central to modern liberal democracies are interrelated aspects of how Western modernity has addressed problems inherited from the Reformation era as a reaction, not an outgrowth. These include individual freedom and autonomy, freedom of religion, religious toleration, the separation of church and state, secular public discourse, the secularization of knowledge, and the pursuit of human fulfillment through material well-being.
Just like the beginning of the Reformation with Luther and Wittenberg, the process of addressing the Reformation era's problems in a new way started in an unlikely place, in a strange little republic at war with Europe's most powerful monarchy and empire, from which it had just declared its independence. In the 1580s, really, who in their right mind would have bet on the Dutch Republic against mighty Spain and its empire? People would have asked, what have you been smoking in those little clay pipes that they're manufacturing in the town of Gouda? Which is how you pronounce it, not Gouda, by the, by the way. Go into the supermarket next time, ask for Gouda cheese. You'll know you're pronouncing it the right way, but they won't know what you're asking for. Okay. <laughs> as unlikely as it might have seemed before the fact, the magistrates and the merchants of Holland cities, above all, hit on something important. They decided to de-emphasize religious uniformity and to go shopping instead. Holland's urban leaders combined limited religious toleration with a seaborne trading empire in what turned out to be the wave of the future. They hit on a new relationship among religion, politics, and economics that would eventually change the world, sowing secularizing seeds of modernity in the tough soil of the Reformation era. Much else would fertilize it, including Enlightenment ideas, but they got the process started. Europeans and other countries noticed the British, in particular, imitated the Dutch and integrated what they learned into their own much more powerful empire in the later 17th and the 18th centuries. It turned out that religious toleration was good for business, so long as the scope of religion was restricted and didn't, heaven forbid, seek to inhibit entrepreneurial initiative or expansionist political ambition. What the Dutch started was extended and first institutionalized in another weird republic at war this time with the British Empire from which it had declared its independence, the United States of America. It combined the federal disestablishment of churches with individual religious freedom and no prescriptions about how citizens should act on their newly protected rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A narrowed de facto Dutch notion of religion persisted American citizens could believe as they pleased and worship as they wished. At the same time, whether rich or poor, Americans exercised their religious freedom as they pursued more and better material possessions, just like the Dutch and the British before them. The advent of the Industrial Revolution that coincided with the creation of the new nation enabled many more people to acquire many more possessions much more cheaply. Industrialization in the 19th century solidified this trend in the US as well as in multiple Western European countries, some sooner than others. It gave everyone else besides, it gave everyone something besides religion to care about and devote themselves to. The most recent expressions of secularization, born of the relationships among religion, politics, and economics, strongly influenced as well by technology, marketing, and ideas, have been visible in the last several decades on both sides of the North Atlantic. Religion's influence has diminished as material affluence has soared. Religion has ceased to have much, if any, capacity to influence society in shared public ways. Religious pluralism enabled by religious freedom means that when religious citizens do enter the political arena, their participation mirrors a secularized, and in the US, deeply divided to say the least, public political culture. One could hardly ask for a more spectacular expression of this than what we have experienced in the US over the last year. Christianity has little capacity to influence the wider society in any coherent collective way because Christians themselves are divided on every contentious political, social, and moral issue, including abortion, same-sex marriage, gun control, immigration, international interventions abroad, and so forth, not to mention our current president. Democratic states today protect an ever-increasing diversity of beliefs, priorities, and practices. A nearly universal participation in consumerist capitalism plus political control by those states serve to hold Western societies together, or at least seem largely to have done so until Brexit and last year's US election showed the political consequences of the chasms of inequality that have opened due to the last 40 years of fundamentalist free market neoliberalism. But these long-term outcomes of attempts to solve the problems inherited from the Reformation era have also unintentionally created new problems of their own. Like, for example, global climate change, a byproduct of the industrial processes that manufacture all that stuff that politically protected consumers want and buy in exercising their individual rights. 
Long-term processes of secularization have been an attempt to control religion and resolve the difficulties that followed in the wake of the Reformation. They're not an extension or fulfillment of the Lutheranism or Reformed Protestantism of the Reformation era. Choosing your own beliefs and values, whether religious or not, and buying as much as you want of whatever you want are worlds away from the freedom of a Christian espoused by Luther or any other 16th century reformer. And when we see what modern freedom can mean in practice, in terms, in terms of choosing to believe and support what you prefer, again, one has only to consider the past year plus in this country anywhere you look, we get some sense of just how far reaching have been the modern institutional and ideological endeavors to deal with the problems inherited from the Reformation era. So in brief and by way of conclusion, that's why the Reformation still matters, whether we like it or not. It unintentionally and indirectly created the world we inhabit, regardless of what we believe or care about by making Christianity itself into an enduring problem that had to be addressed. The way it was addressed redefined religion and made it separable from the rest of life. And now, increasingly, we see evidence of what that separation looks like. And we will continue to see evidence of it, facilitated powerfully by the combination of politically protected individual preferences, technology, and money, some of the expressions of which we probably cannot imagine and which will be as unexpected as were the eventual consequences of what happened 500 years ago. So whatever one thinks about what we ought to do now, it seems to me that one is well advised to acknowledge the character of our situation in which we find ourselves and how we got to where we are. It certainly presents challenges to Christians seeking to discern and live out their vocations in whatever specific geographical, institutional, and social locations they inhabit. Thank you.